two very important lectures <coughs> next Thursday. Uh, Jennifer Roskis is coming. She's doing a PhD at Bar Ilan University on gender studies, and she's also a consultant for ISA, and is doing, I think, groundbreaking work at looking at feminist theory and anti-Semitism and the demonization of Israel and sort of Middle Eastern uh, uh, politics. And Ben Drory Amini is coming, and he's uh, one of the editors and journalists in Mariv, and has been doing important work over the years on the demonization of Israel and sort of the hypocrisy within the media and journalism. So they're both going to be here. It's going to be at 4.15 for Jennifer Roskies and 7.30 for uh, Ben Drory Amini. So today, it's really an honor to have Professor Barry Rubin. Uh, Professor Rubin's lecture is entitled, How the PLO Adopted Anti-Semitism as Anti-Zionism. But given uh, Professor Rubin's expertise and given the sort of fluid situation that we are witnessing in terms of geopolitical politics, uh, glo not only globally, but specifically to the Middle East, with Turkey, Syria, Iran, Russia, China, and the American sort of vying for power and changing relations. I think uh, Professor Rubin's expertise um, will be, it's wonderful that he's here today to sort of unpack the very fluid situation. So Professor Rubin is the director of the Global Research uh, and International Affairs Center, or known as Gloria, which is at the Interdisciplinary Research, uh, sorry, the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya, or known as the IDC, which is the first and I believe still the only private university in Israel. Professor Rubin, who's at the IDC, is, a se is also a senior feller, fellow at the IDC's Policy Institute for Counterterrorism. He's the research director of the Lauder School of Government, Diplomacy, and Strategy. He's the editor of the Journal of Turkish Studies. He's also the editor of the Middle East Review of International Affairs, known as uh, Maria and is a member of the editorial board of the Middle East Quarterly. He was the director of the Begin Sadat Center of Strategic Studies uh, in Tel Aviv. He was a Fulbright scholar or fellow, and he was also a fellow at the Council for Foreign Relations, uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities and International Affairs. Uh, he was a grantee of the U.S. Institute of Peace, the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation, and the Leonard Davis Center. He was a senior fellow at the Washington Institute of Near East Studies in Washington, D.C., of John Hopkins University's Foreign Policy Institute, and Georgetown University's Strategic, uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies. In addition, I can go on for a, a long time, he's been the, he, he writes, uh, in aside to all the work he's doing in public speaking, he writes incredibly well and in a major volumes. Um, he's written five books on terrorism, he's edited volumes that deal with political Islam, three volumes on political Islam, eight volumes on uh, Middle East and Iraqi, uh, sort of the Middle East, Iraq, after Saddam Hussein, uh, at the center of world, uh, re sorry, the region at the center of the world, crisis and quandaries in the contemporary Persian Gulf. He co-authored several books, including one with his wife, Judith Kolf Rubin, on hating America, a, a history, anti-American terrorism in the Middle East, and the Israel Arab Reader. He's written more than 40 book chapters. Um, he's a frequent contributor, as you know, to the Jerusalem Post, but also to the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, LA Times, Foreign Affairs, Middle East Quarterly, and many other publications. Uh, and he's a frequent guest in the international media, the major international media in the United States and throughout the world. So it's really an honor for us to have Professor Rubin today. Thank you. Well, that's very kind of you. I was actually very tired by the end of it. <laughs> but I actually, I should say, I'm pleased to announce not only pleased to be here at Yale, but I'm pleased to announce that I'm now working with Yale University Press and uh, I'm doing uh, two books that uh, Yale University Press is bringing out. Uh, one is um, an Israel introductory guide, and the other is a history of uh, German uh, Middle East policy, um, including but not only in, in the Nazi era. So thank you very much. 
Um, my oh, and bef so I don't forget later. If any of you would like to receive our uh, publications, either Maria Journal, which is more of a scholarly journal, or our shorter articles, or both, uh, just give me your emails and at the end, clearly written, and I'll be happy to uh, give you free subscriptions. My problem today is there's too many things I want to talk about. So what I, I thought I would do, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about roughly five topics and to give you more of a survey and then I'll be happy to answer questions at any of them. First topic I, I want to talk about is, uh, briefly of course, which one? First topic is why is the Middle East a, 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 such a mess as a region? The second is, what is the biggest current issue which shapes the region? The third is, what's happening with Israel-Palestinian and Arab-Israeli peace process uh, issues? Um, and then the fourth is a bit of a, a discussion of, of how anti-Semitism plays into this. And, and then finally, at the end, I'm gonna, I'll touch on a very interesting and complicated subject, which is uh, the PL. It, it, it's very complicated to say because you have to do with three different groups, the PLO, Fatah, and the Palestinian Authority, which are all very roughly kind of the same thing now, very roughly, um, and how that works in. But look, before beginning, I'll just make a remark on, on anti-Semitism. It's easy enough to say anti-Semitism is bad, who's anti but the, for me, the, the real question is the political utility that is, that is the use of it as a, as a tool, why it makes sense, and the different variations. And, and it's a complicated issue, but it's a very interesting one. But let me begin by a quotation from Theodore Herzl, who uh, about 110 years ago wrote an amazing paragraph, which goes something like this. He said, we live today in an age of marvels and of technological advances. The telegraph uh, brings people together around the world. Steamships and railroads uh, carry people very quickly everywhere. But there's one thing which has not changed. I think, I think I actually almost have it by heart now. From the time that our ancestors rode on ox carts, and that is the unreasoning hatred of the Jewish people. Now he wrote that roughly around 1895, let's say, give or take a couple of years. And the funny thing is that for a long period of time, let's say roughly from 1950 to into the 90s, this seemed to be something of historical interest. But now we can update it and say we live in an age of technological marvels with the internet, with jet planes, but one thing hasn't changed from the time of the telegraph, the steamboat, and from the time of the ox carts. <laughs> uh, and that's an interesting continuity. Um, having studied the Middle East for over 30 years, <coughs> and devoted a lot of my writings to answering the question, what's, what's the problem, what's wrong? I would say that the, this is uh, the problem that objectively, and by the way, what, what I, mo the, most of what I tell you is precisely what I hear um, from the Arab, Arabic speaking world, in private, every day, and I, a lot of the things I've told you I've learned from uh, Arab colleagues, uh, that the problem is that objectively, Middle East, by which I mean Arabic-speaking states in Iran, are behind West in economic terms and in other terms. And people know it. And the question is, how do you explain it, and what do you do about it? And the, the liberal interpretation is, we have to make reforms and changes to borrow certain things, and we can adapt them, uh, that work. Um, historically, people used to say constitutionalism, and and a more free enterprise economy, and there's a whole list. Uh, free speech, equality uh, of the genders, you know, you know the list. And, and, and if we do this, then we can make rapid progress. And that basically is the liberal response, and still the liberal response, but it's distinctly a minority response. Because the principal response, there are two principal responses. Uh, one of those, which is predominantly, but not exclusively, the, the Islamist response is, uh, well, we don't want to be like them uh, anyway, we're better, we have to keep what we have, and in that context we can do technological development and so on, but basically we don't want to follow this as, as a model. And anyway, the, one of the main reasons we're behind 
is because they have oppressed us and held us back. And a secondary reason is because we've abandoned Islam. The alternative approach, which is the nationalist approach, is a little different. Somewhere in between, it says, the main problem is that they've held us back through imperialism, uh, and first we have to unite and throw off their power, but then, and, 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 and we don't necessarily want democracy and so on, but then we can adopt various things as long as they don't affect us too much. But the, the, what, what the basic problem is that while the liberal response has been that the problem is mainly internal, we need to make changes, the nationalist, and by, when I say Arab nationalist, it has a very specific meaning. The, 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 by, I'm very short on time, so I'm just trying to be very brief, and of course you can read what I've written on these things. The nationalist and Islamist response is the basic point is to say the problem is external. It's not us. We don't have to do anything except maybe if you're an Islamist, overthrow the regime. If you're a nationalist, unite everyone together. Uh, but the main problem is to defeat the external enemy. The external enemy today, I mean, is Israel, Zionism, the West, the United States. And the, 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 of course, one problem is what if you can't defeat the external enemy, then you're forever in suspended animation, um, and you never get to the point of progress. And to some extent, that's what's happened. So the principal problem in the Middle East is the debate over why are we behind in various respects, what do we have to do about it, uh, that those an the answers that are given are generally wrong and unworkable answers. And this creates a great deal of problem. The other aspect, a great deal of difficulty, the other aspect of the problem is that in most countries, wherever they are in the world, and again, it's very complicated, I'm being very brief and simple to try to get across these themes, that if things don't work, you change them. If the system doesn't work, you change the system, reform, revolution, uh, whatever. If the government is inefficient, incompetent, oppressive, uh, and s uh, down the list, then sooner or later you get rid of the government. But in the Middle East, what has happened up to this point to a large extent is that, that regimes have learned the lesson of how to stay in power. That we tend to think of, for understandable reasons, of the Middle East as a very unstable region. But in many ways, it's a very stable region. With the exception of Iraq, which was an external action, Every, the, the, the regime in every Arabic-speaking country today is the same as it was in 1974, which was 35 years ago. In fact, in some cases, it's the same exact people who are running things. And again, I'm being very brief here because you have to put footnotes in from Lebanon and there are all sorts of things, but I, I'm trying to get the theme across. So therefore, the problem is this. The, 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 the interpretation of their situation, the proposed solutions for the situation, and the power of regimes and a system which doesn't do a good job to stay in power. And how does it stay in power? And this is a long story. I mean, it involves, it's, it's a fascinating story about which I read a book called Modern Dictators. You know, they've learned how to handle the military. They've learned how to do repression in a clever manner. They've learned how to do corruption in generally a clever manner. Um, they've learned how to control the economy and to use the economy not to increase wealth or raise living standards, but to keep the regime in power. But the issue that most involves us today here is they have learned how to use the specter of external enemies to stay in power. That if, if the problem is external, the problem is imperialism, Zionism, the West, the US, Israel, we have to fight those and defeat them. Uh, therefore, you all have to unite around the regime. You have to support your local dictator. Or to use a, a very, a, an Arab proverb that's often used here, no voice can rise above the din of battle. Which the, of which the, the, the basic translation to American slang is the old World War II line, don't you know there's a war on? And if there's a war on, then we can't afford reform. 
We can't afford to change the economy. We can't afford to cut the military. We can't afford to do all these things because we have to continue the battle against the enemy, and that comes first, and you have to rally around the dictatorship, no matter how corrupt and competent uh, or whatever it is. And that, essentially, up until today, up until recently, has been the dominant ethos in the region. Now, in, you can already see, perhaps, that in this context, anti-Semitism, in different ways, and I'm going to give you a very novel approach to the issue a little, in a little bit, has a very important role. Because Israel is your enemy, so either, therefore, the Jews are evil, terrible, and try to destroy you, or the Zionists are terrible and, and evil and trying to destroy you. But you, you can use, and here's a hint to what I want to say about the PLO, you can use all the traditional character, all the traditional categories of anti-Semitism, and you just have to change one word. You have to change the word Jewish and Zionist. And that solves your problem. So we can see that that ideological tool is a very important tool in this mechanism of preserving the status quo, of keeping everything unchanged, of directing people's energy and attention to external enemies. Now, some people have misinterpreted, perhaps in part deliberately, what I said, so I'll just clarify it. I'm not saying this is all coming from the regime downward. There are also strong elements in popular belief and culture to which it plays. It's a dialectical process. Given this, so you all with me so far? Okay. So therefore, what is, what is the main issue at present? We saw that between, let's say, 1952 to into the 90s, the failure of the Arab regimes. The Arab regimes were all Arab nationalist regimes. And in the context of what I've just explained to you, this is theme number two, they made promises. If you follow us, we will destroy Israel, we will defeat and expel Western influence, we will unite the Arab world, and we will be, bring dramatic economic and social progress. And none of those promises were kept. 52, 62, 72, 82, 92, so, and Soviet bloc fell and communism fell. Two, that's, 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 a, that's a piece of the puzzle. And so people began to get tired. And even though the mechanisms were pretty good, they did erode. And you had the Iranian Revolution and you had other events. So there arose a new force to challenge the existing nationalist dominated system. Uh, and that was Islamism, political Islamism. Not Islam, but Islamism as a political doctrine saying we must seize state power and impose a Sharia system and, and if we do all this and overthrow the existing regimes then we will solve all the problems that they fail to solve. Now there's a real parallelism. These are rival doctrines. These are things over which people kill each other. But there is a certain parallelism here, which is one reason why Islamism is done well, because it can feed off some of the material from Arab nationalism. Arab nationalism says, Israel is evil, terrible, the source of our problems, it must be destroyed. The Islamists say, well, we agree completely, why have you failed to destroy it? Arab nationalism says, the West is our enemy, imperialism is our enemy, America is our enemy. And the Islamists say, well, we agree, why do some of you then make deals with the United States and the West? Why do you call in Western troops to save you, Saudi Arabia, when Iraq invades Kuwait, as one example? So, so there is some interplay. But the critical, and this is theme number two, the critical issue at present, the most important issue and struggle for the Middle East of this generation, and possibly the most important issue in the entire world, is the struggle, and I know it's simplistic to put it this way, the struggle between the nationalists and the Islamists neither of which are democratic. And here you have the problem of the liberals, because if I, it, it depends, every country is different, just very simplistically, let me say, if you want to think of it roughly, that 65%, I mean, these are arbitrary numbers, but there's some reasonableness in them. Roughly, I would argue that in the Arabic-speaking world today, roughly 65% of the people still see themselves as nationalists or communalists, maybe 20 to 30 percent 
see themselves supporting some form of Islamism, and 5% are liberal Democrats. And I, if anything, I've exaggerated the extent of liberal Democrats. In the great battle between these two elephants, the small mammal of liberalism is dodging around. And just to, just to tell you uh, one little anecdote among many about this, only in a situation like this, specifically in Syria, could, could an, an Arab liberal who has been in prison in Syria make a statement in an interview, our government, Syrian government, is a fascist government, and five minutes later say, we all have to support, we must support the Syrian government. Why is that? Because as much as he hates the Syrian government, he's more afraid of the Islamists. So he is ready, uh, and this is, by the way, what's happened to liberals in the Arab world in the last five years or so, they've had to make a choice. In pretty much every country, with the exception to some extent of Egypt, they've chosen to support the regimes. Only, I would say, only in Egypt has a considerable body of liberals decided to support the, uh, the Islamists. So this is the great battle. And in this battle, one of the things this battle does is it's tended to pull the regimes and the nationalists, at least in part, toward a more radical stance. In other words, that although, to some, although they combat the Islamists, they're also echoing the Islamists. And so while the main development of anti-Semitism has been among the radical Islamists, it's also been very much reflected by the nationalists who are trying to compete. Not to compete in moderation, which is, by the way, the kind of thing we've seen in many parts of the world, but to compete um, in radicalism. And, by the way, very, clear, uh, very clearly true in the Palestinian case. How does one, therefore, see Arab-Israeli, Israeli-Palestinian um, issues within the context of, of, of these things? Um, and, and one might say, to put it simply, there's good news and there's bad news. Uh, the, the, I'll start with the bad news since we're talking about the Middle East. Um, the bad news is that, in my opinion, and I don't say this because of ideological conviction or political conviction, I don't want to say this, but my job is to say things I don't want to say. My job, and, and, and I know there are many in academia and journals who don't agree with me, my job is to absolutely refuse to allow myself to engage in wishful thinking. And my job, as far as I'm concerned, is to absolutely refuse to allow myself to engage in something that I call lying for peace, which means deliberately misrepresenting the situation because one feels that's better for everybody. Uh, I, I come from uh, enlightenment scientific method uh, what, what, what to me means, liberal background, that uh, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, or at least do your, do your best to try. There's no possibility of a comprehensive resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, or uh, on paper, uh, a full and formal resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Now, there are a variety of reasons for this. On the Palestinian side, I would say, and I could go on at great length about this, Palestinian movement has still not made the basic decision of whether they prefer peace and statehood to conflict in the hopes of winning total victory in the future. And when they have to make a choice, as they made more than once in the last week, um, they have chosen to maintain the struggle in hopes that they'll win a total victory in the future. And I could give you several examples of that. One is the choice of the successor uh, of um, the Palestinian Authority's uh, leader. Um, um, and uh, very few people have noted this, but, uh, but he has uh, chosen uh, Mohammed Ghanim. Uh, Mohammed Ghanim is the most, oh, the most radical, extreme, anti-peace person he could have chosen. He had 20, 30 people he could have chosen. He has chosen as his successor, I'm talking here about Mahmoud Abbas, uh, a man who was so radical that he rejected the 1993 uh, Oslo Agreement and broke with Arafat and accused Arafat of selling out. And this is the man who has been designated as the next leader of the Palestinian Authority, Fatan, and the PLL. And there are other examples, too, that I could give. So this is the underlying problem. 
And I think that overwhelmingly Israelis and overwhelmingly Palestinians are quite aware that the idea that there's going to be a comprehensive peace uh, in the near future uh, is, is nonsense, except that most people in Europe and the U.S. are convinced of the exact opposite. That's the bad news. The good news is that that, that doesn't mean that everybody wants to fight now. The fact is that despite their continuing militant rhetoric, and in some cases, obviously not Egypt and Jordan, their refusal to make peace, that the most Arab states do not, aside from Syria, which is an exception here, don't want to go to war either. They don't, they, they feel that engaging in the conflict in terms of their rhetoric and not making peace and sometimes giving money for terrorism is in their interests, but that not getting into a war and not engaging in the kind of high-profile efforts they made in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s is also in their interest. And I can tell you about numerous uh, behind-the-scenes conversations and things I've been involved with that demonstrate that fact. The good news with the Palestinian Authority uh, is uh, that although they are unwilling and unable to make a comprehensive peace, uh, that you can make interim agreement, well, at least up until now, we'll have to see what happens uh, in the future. You can make interim agreements and talk and try to work out things to minimize violence, to, to raise living standards, uh, and to basically try to keep, and also to, to, to ensure that Hamas doesn't take over the West Bank until the day when it becomes possible uh, that there can be peace. I will tell you that in a conversation with a leading Israeli intellectual of the left, he said to me, when do you, th when do you think there'll be a comprehensive peace and end of the conflict? And I said, I'm very pessimistic, 30 to 40 years. And he replied, you call that pessimistic? 100 years. Um, now, having talked about all those things, how much time do I have left? Oh, not that much? All right. Well, let me, I'll tell you what, let me say a few, since I've covered a lot of ground, um, and if you want, if you want, and the chair allows, we can talk about, well, actually, I will say a word now about Iran nuclear weapons, if I might, because it, it feeds in that, and I'll talk a bit about Palestine, PLO, Fatah, PA, and then we'll break for questions, maybe even a little earlier, um, if, uh, if you permit. I'll say something now about Iran nuclear, not just because it's an important issue, but because it fits into this framework very much. Now, as you know, people have spoken a great deal about if Iran gets nuclear weapons, then it may use them against Israel, and I'd be disintegrated, and, which so it's a matter of, you know, personal interest to me. And this is a real possibility. It is a real possibility, it's very important. But, but you've heard that already. What interests me is all the other things that you haven't heard about. What would the other implications be completely outside of that issue? And, and probably Iran would not, would not attack Israel with nuclear weapons. The possibility is high enough to be of great concern, you know, but it's not 190, 80, 70, 60%, 50%. Well, there are four other things. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll go through three of them more quickly. One of them is uh, that Israel can defend itself. Arab states, and again, I always exclude Syria here. Syria is the ally of Iran. Arab states cannot defend themselves from nuclear weapons. And, and every Arab, Arab, Arab state, Arabic-speaking state people are saying, well, let me see. Am I going to de depend on Barack Obama to protect me from the Iranians. Do I believe that it's a rational calculation that if I depend on the United States, I'll be okay? And increasingly they're answering either no or, well, yeah, to some extent, but I need a lot of insurance. And so if Iran gets nuclear weapons, then this is going to lead to Arab states appeasing Iran, doing to a, up to a point what Iran wants. And one of the things Iran would want is forget about any easing or resolution of the, of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And they will give that to Iran. And they will cave into Iran on a lot of issues. 
The second point is that the same applies to Europe, that their appeasement of Iran will go up, uh, that Europe or the U.S. couldn't do certain things in the Middle East they would want to do. The third thing I'll just go over very briefly is the price of oil would zoom upward because Iran is a price hawk and the Saudis wouldn't stand against them. But it's the fourth and final point that I want to stress here, that if Iran gets nuclear weapons, it will be perceived as proving the success of a radical Islamist model. That Iran worked, they are strong, they are stronger than the West, they show them they're going to get rid of Israel for us, whether or not that's true. And therefore, we better jump on the bandwagon. And I would predict that tens, even hundreds of thousands of people throughout the Arabic-speaking world and in immigrant communities in Europe will join radical Islamist groups, that the level of conflict and the level of violence will go up in every Arabic-speaking state and in Europe. The irony is that one country that's not affected is Israel, because they're already doing everything they can do. But with that, and relating to our specific purpose here, uh, the Iranian-style anti-Semitism will also go up, because that will be adopted increasingly as part of the uh, theology. Let me uh, turn now to conclude with a discussion of uh, anti-Semitism in the case of the PLO. Because Hamas is easy, Hamas is using classical anti-Semitism. Um, it's much more complicated. In, from its inception, 60s and 70s, Fatah and the PLO had to be careful. They, they thought consciously that they had to be careful. Because if they were identified as anti-Semitic, and remember, people were very much conscious of the Nazi model, that it would be a di political disadvantage to them. Um, so they tried to find some way around it. Now, they needed to have a systematic anti-Zionist uh, ideology. Uh, so they had several options to choose from, and they actually used all of them sometimes simultaneously. One option, which I suppose could appear to be the progressive option in the 60s and 70s and 80s, you don't really see it as much anymore, really, is the idea that the PLO and Fatah were the true champions of the Jews. Because Zionism was against Jewish interests, uh, that, it was, um, that it had nothing to do with Judaism, uh, and therefore, uh, that the true interests of Judaism equated with Israel's destruction. And, and, they, were, and they were then um, carrying that out. And the arguments were made, some of the fascinating arguments that were made in this vein. For example, it was argued that since uh, fascist anti-Semitism had identified Jews as a people or a nation, that their, and, and not only as a pure religion, that therefore, by refusing to accept the idea that Jews were a people or a nation, that the PLO and Fatah were anti-anti-Semitic, if you uh, see my point. Uh, and early on, it was also recognized that if, and this is much more common now, but as early as 1968, Yasser Arafat was referring to Israel as, uh, as neo-Nazi. Um, and, and this is a very uh, old theme. The problem is that while they were arguing that they were the true champions of the Jews, at the same time, of course, and we're talking now about the late 60s and into the 70s, that PLO groups, sometimes the very ones that were arguing that they were the champion Jews, were sending terrorists in to murder anybody they could get their hands on. Um, so this argument um, saved them from from being called uh, uh, anti-Semitic or neo-Nazi themselves, but didn't have much, um, didn't have much uh, uh, play. The problem was they couldn't stick to this argument because at the same time they were always tempted by uh, either anti-Semitic or what might be called uh, apologies for anti-Semitic ideology. For example, Nabil Amr was still around, who was PLO representative in Moscow, said anti-Semitism was a Zionist invention designed to justify Israeli policies 
and blackmail the societies where there are Jewish uh, minorities. This is also a theme we still see. The Holocaust, either the radical position, there was no Holocaust, to the moderate position, um, the, Israel's just using the Holocaust to rationalize its, its, its policies. Um, and that's something that, that uh, uh, we still see today. Um, so you had the you had the we are the true pro-Jews position. You had the more or less classical anti-Semitic position, and then you had a third kind of a neo uh, left-wing position, which I'll come to. What were the sources of PLO thinking about Jews in Israel? Uh, and, and although the balance changes all the time, all these factors. Well, the first is the Quran and Islamic doctrine. Remember that the Quran and Islamic doctrine forms the great majority of the Islamists' thinking. It doesn't form the great majority of the radical and nationalists' thinking, but it forms a considerable part of it. And the truth is, and this is not something recent, you can see this in the literature of the 60s and 70s and 80s, there are a lot of Islamic sources that lend themselves to anti-Semitism. And these were used um, you know, by, uh, by uh, Palestinian movement. So, for example, the idea that Muhammad killed or expelled all the Jews in Arabia, that the Jews tried to kill Muhammad, um, all of these things uh, which you see today coming from people like Hamas or Ahmadinejad, were in PLO and Fatah ideology at their most, quote, left-wing uh, era. Um, I mean, here's, for example, this is a quote uh, from a PLO organ in 1969. You can use these things because it really doesn't change that much over time. Um, the Israelites equipped the deity with their own morals and disposition, fond of war, attack, revenge, and destruction, um, the Talmud was antagonistic to other peoples, portraying the Jews as superior and permitting them to steal from non-Jews. Um, one of the most interesting for me is a statement made by Abu Yad, a fellow I had a very interesting meeting with not too long after this. Remember that Abu Yad was seen as being the leader of the left wing of Fatah. This statement was made in November of 1989. He was the second most powerful person in the PLO. Um, he said, the Jews are the scum of humanity, uh, treachery flows in their blood, as the Quran testifies, the Jews are the same as they've always been. Now this is coming from a guy who probably considered himself a neo-Marxist. But you see how easily these themes uh, flow across. Um, a second factor that came in in addition to um, historical Islam is the Dhimmi system. Um, the idea that uh, Jew, the, the, the rightful place of Jews uh, is that they should accept being inferior uh, and if, keep their place. Um, and and you, I'm sure you're familiar with all of this. And that Israel's existence was a violation of that because Jews were not supposed to have a country or be a government or have people. But of course, there were other problems that Jews were not supposed to win wars um, and, and other things. And so there's a great deal of trouble with this cognitive dissonance. I mean, this is a constant problem. How do you explain that reality is not the way it's supposed to be? Um, Pre-1948, Palestinian Arab contact with the Jews. Um, I mean, a critical factor here, and this is not an anti-Semitic factor by any means, but a critical factor in the thinking is, we believe that Jews are cowards, we believe that Jews are naturally to submit, we believe that Jews can't win war, we believe that Jews are not a people. Therefore, Israel is an impossibility. It can't exist. It's not that we don't want it to exist, it can't exist, and it won't exist uh, very long. In fact, I think that if you had to pick a couple of statements that are absolutely essential and central to the thinking. And by the way, the basis for terrorism, uh, I would pick these two. In 1970, a PLO <coughs> official said, Jews cannot bear to live forever under the tension and threat of violence. Zionist efforts to transform them into a homogeneous, cohesive nation have failed, 
And so any objective study of the enemy will reveal that his potential for endurance, except briefly, is limited. In 1968, the Palestinian Palestine National Council, which is the PLO's parliament, concluded wearing down Israel will inevitably provide the opportunity for a decisive confrontation in which the entire nation can emerge victorious. So it's not like just terrorism is being mean, or terrorism comes out of ruthlessness. It's that terrorism was a very carefully considered and chosen strategy based on an evaluation of Jews and of Israel, of course also of Arab capabilities. But a lot of thought went into these things. A lot of thought went into these strategic decisions. Um, this is all very political. Very, very political. Uh, a fourth element is imported anti-Semitism. Uh, it's extremely important not to overestimate the importance of imported anti-Semitism. It is a distinctly secondary characteristic, even tertiary. And people who really know about, who really study these things, I think, will really understand. It's there. Uh, the protocols of the elders of Zion's influence can be seen in Hamas documents, but don't overstate it. A fifth, which should be stated separately, are uh, conspiracy theories. Um, and this is a very, and I'll, I'll just give an example of one which I think gives a really good sense of, of, how the, of how this works, of how the formation of ideology and strategy works. How do you explain the relationship between Israel and the US or Israel and the West? Why does the US tend to support Israel? How do you explain that? And basically, there are three ways to, I mean, there are three ways to explain it. One way, which you could say is the most moderate way, is this is a mistake or an accident, and we can persuade the U.S. or the West to change their views by various means. But this was generally not, even to, the, even to this day, even to this week, as Fatah denounces Barack Obama as anti-Palestinian, it's not the one that they've chosen. Maybe it's the one the Saudis have chosen. Okay. They chose from two others. And to put it simply, one is America dominates Israel, or Israel dominates America. America dominates Israel is the neo-Marxist kind of uh, anti-imperialist conception that, that, uh, that Israel is an arm of America, the arm of the West, in taking over the Middle East and so on, and destroying the Arab unity and all of this. And you see that. Um, it's tended to decline over time, particularly in the post-Cold War world. It's still there. The other is, of course, the classically anti-Semitic argument, which is Jews control America. And this is all over the place. And it's tended to go up more in recent years. Um, there's a lot more I could say. I don't want to go on too long. Um, I just, as an example, of how, how difficult it is for the Palestinian movement to conceptualize and deal with Israel. Um, you can't do any better than something that Yasser Arafat said in 1988. <clears throat> Remember, 1988 was a year when they sort of started thinking about negotiation. So he wrote, the, the arrogant forces in Israel do this and that, he says. And Arafat says, how can this arrogance of Israel be stopped with another Masada? Now, Arafat may have thought that he was being persuasive of his moderation, but of course, Masada symbolizes genocide, symbolizes destruction, wiping out. So they often don't perform very well. They only really have two ultimate protections. One is things said in Arabic which are, which are not translated, are not translated very widely. And the second is the unwillingness of media and scholars to publish stuff which goes against what they're trying to do politically, which is to bring peace and to portray the Palestinian movement as more moderate than it is, and therefore they censor out a great deal. Um, finally, um, and briefly, the Palestinian movement has had and still has a lot of very difficult questions to answer. And I'll go through these briefly, but each of these is fascinating. The first question is, how do you explain Israel's existence? And if you can't 
You know, you can be somebody's enemy, but you can make an honest attempt to understand, you know, and understand them. Um, so how do you explain Israel's existence? Now, the obvious way is Jews suffered, uh, they came up with an interpretation the, the, over time that Jews are a people, Jews wanted a country of their own like other people, uh, they suffered in, under, under the Nazis, and so on. So, so therefore, Israel was created as an expression of the will of many or most Jewish people as a genuine, um, a genuine uh, outcome of Judaism and Jewish people's history. So, now, you can still be against Israel and say that, but they don't say that. I mean, it's almost impossible to find Palestinian statements that say that people really in the movement. So they have to explain it as either the Zionists trick the Jews and aren't really Jewish, or it's American imperialism, or some kind of conspiracy. They cannot, and as long, and by the way, of course, there, again, there are many different people with different views. I've written um, three books on Palestinian politics. I can go down a list. I'll go down the list of the Fatah Central Committee or every member of the Palestinian uh, uh, Legislative Council and analyze each one differently. But basically, this is a point. The second problem, so it's tempting to, gi to give an anti-Semitic explanation to solve a mystery they can't solve, which is why Israel exists. The second quest problem, question they have is, why do Jews support Israel? And again, you can give an honest and clear answer for that, even if you're against it. Um, but of course, both the Islamists and the Nationalists tend not to be able to, to deal with that. The third is, how are the Jews defined? Uh, religion, people, whatever. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping ahead uh, here. Um, what power do Jews have in the world? As they said, why do people in the West tend to support Israel? Um, do they see, if you say, for example, people in the West tend to, tend to support Israel because they see it as a modern society and as a fellow democracy uh, and, you know, several other things, you, you can understand it. But if you refuse to say those things, you have to resort to conspiracy theories, uh, they're fooled by the Jews, or imperialistic, but then you can't understand it. How should the Holocaust be understood? Um, and so on. Now, in political terms, the, the real problem here is not that there's a strong anti-Semitic element in the worldview and ideology of the Palestinian movement. And by the way, again, there's forces and things on the other side, but they tend more often to be private rather than public. Um, there are things you can't say. Um, that the problem is not that it's an anti-Semitic element. The problem is that the worldview that dominates the Palestinian movement makes it impossible for the Palestinian movement to make a full and lasting peace with Israel. Because if you, and by and there's a lot, believe me, there's a lot of double think going on here because I deal with Palestinian leaders and they and they've seen Israel, and they've visited Israel, and they see Israel's strength. And they, but it's very difficult for them to put this into political and strategic terms. I mean, does Mahmoud Abbas, the leader of the Palestinian Authority, a man who wrote his doctoral dissertation, incidentally, uh, on the uh, idea that the Holocaust didn't quite happen, does he really believe that, that Fatah and the Palestinian Authority are going to destroy Israel? Well, on one level, he knows it's ridiculous. And on another level, he believes it. Well, these things are complicated. They're not cartoons. But if you believe Israel is not a real country, that the Jews cannot be a people, this entity cannot go on existing, that it's going to fall apart, that it's not in any sense, even if you're its enemy, it's not legitimate. You can't, and that, and that if to make and that's a demonic, horrible group of war criminals, which is what people are saying at the UN, not too far south here. You can't make peace. You can't make peace with such an evil force, and you don't have to make peace if it's going to collapse. And remember, one aspect of this belief is if you can somehow pry international support away from Israel, then Israel will collapse. That's an element of the collapse. 
So the chances for P, for full formal peace ending the conflict are pretty much zero. And that these ideas and expectations and what is permissible in strategic terms play a central role in that. Or, in other words, speaking as Jew of Jewish history, I don't care if people hate me. What I care about is what does that hatred make them do in operational terms? And here, the miscomprehension, the expectations, the ideology, the elements of anti-Semitism, uh, and, and, and so on, have a great political impact, the Palestinian movement, and on the region, uh, along with some of the other things. And this shapes the Middle East and the world that we're in today. Finally, one sentence. There are people who believed that the West was going to reshape the thinking of the Middle East. And in fact, the Middle East has had more effect in reshaping the thinking of the West. In 1985, I wrote a book, uh, Getting Away from Middle East Studies, called Assimilation and Its Discontents, which is a history of the concept of assimilation. And in that book, there's a, there is a sentence that goes something like this. Today, 1985, today, anti-Semitism is at the lowest point in 2,000 years. And Hillel Halkin, who is a very fine writer, and if you know him, picked up on that and he wrote an article a few years ago. He said, when I read that sentence, I completely agreed with it. We all thought that way, but who would think that way today? Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. We're going to open up, open up for questions and answers. I'm going to start with a question. Um, so to pick up on your last point of, um, of the West trying to influence the Middle East. And, there's two points. I think in the last few months there's been some excitement by the success of the economic activity and growth in the West Bank. And this is sort of being held up as the potential for some liberal success economically, that economic development will bring, bring around some sort of more liberal, rational, enlightenment thought. Um, and you mentioned through the Middle East and also in Persia that the, the, the nationalists are sort of vying for power with the Islamists. Yeah. So my no, question is... Not, not Iran. Not, doesn't, Iran is separate. Okay, right. But, uh, but coming to Iran, you mentioned in both places that uh, the liberals are the small 2, 3, 4, 5 percent of the... Not, not talk, in the Arabic-speaking world. Okay, in the Arabic-speaking world. Iran is completely different. Okay. Given Iran's influence in the Middle East, given Iran's influence in uh, the Palestinian society, Gaza, West Bank, my question is twofold. Why do you think that Obama blocked... Yeah. At supporting, uh, you know, days before in Cairo, he was calling upon the Muslim world to take on sort of a civil rights, anti-apartheid, non-violent movement to, to bring change. And days later, literally millions of people are in the streets begging the West and begging Obama to take a position, to take a strong stand. Let me, let me just finish. Okay, you only have three questions. I have two questions. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Okay. And, uh, and Obama and the, the administration at least on the streets of Iran, fail to answer their call. The second question that I'd like to ask is, so why do you think that happened? And the second question is, when you spoke about Iran having a nuclear weapon and the changes that this will have in the political equation of the Middle East and globally, uh, and that the Sunni states are going to be threatened, that Israel will be threatened, and parts of Europe will be threatened, I have a cynical question. Is this bad for the United States? They're far away. The United States supplies 75% of the world's armaments, and this may be wonderful for business. Okay, well, well, okay, I mean, aside from everything else, the U.S. isn't going to sell arms to Islamists anyway, so you've asked about five they, questions. They, they you've asked about five questions. Uh, we can discuss that. We've got, you've asked about five <laughs> questions, and I'm going to try to answer some of them. Uh, Seriously. First of all, the economic question. The idea is economic, economic growth and development is, the, is a basis for stability. And clearly, 
um, that can be true. There are three problems, and, and, and very true. I think most, very true in the Palestinian case. There are three problems. The first problem is, in the broad sense, that economic change brings instability. I, I'm not going to go into detail, but I'll just mention in passing. If we look at the causes of the Iranian Revolution, one of the main causes is the changes brought about by economic development. Mass immigration from villages to cities, conflicts between groups over allocation of resources, growth of a large educated class for whom there were a job. So even though there is an argument that economic development brings, can bring stability, it also brings instability. And European history shows that too. The second point of economics is uh, because, um, and this doesn't apply to the West, does not apply to the West Bank, but so much, but that, that the regime, part, I, I said at the beginning, part of the regime's desire is to control the economy and that the main purpose of the economy is not to produce growth, development, higher living standards, but to keep the regime in power. This is, by the way, very much along the lines of the communist model. Um, and if I, one can't do better but talk about Syria. Syria, as an example, Syrian regime wants to control the economy. People say, oh, we are going to moderate them because we're going to offer them all these advantages of rapprochement with the West, which will lead to investment and, and, and other things. But that threatens the existence of the regime. Because if you have Western companies coming in and investing and doing joint deals and so on, it, low, it can lower the degree to which the government um, controls the economy, and it brings in these external factors. And one point I've noted is that in many cases, liberal reformers are people who have links with foreign companies. So for example, the most courageous dissident in Syria, his family is very big in textiles, and among other things, he has the franchise for Adidas sports shoes. Because it allows them an element of independence from the regime. They're not like just getting the contracts, turning on and off the faucet, and, and the regimes know that. So the regimes are not interested in, in the case of Saudi Arabia, well, we have to be careful, because if we go too far, then the, the most Islamic, Islamic people will be upset. So you've got to be careful. So the regimes limit economic development. And the third is violence. So Winston Churchill, in 1899, Winston Churchill, just before he left Sudan, wrote, it may be that a century from now, Sudan will be a wealthy and prosperous country, but I doubt it. Um, blood is not a good fertilizer in making countries or economies grow. Mm -hmm. And in fact, so if you have instability, if you have the possibility of violence, I mean, would I invest in the West Bank? You know, I'd say, well, who knows what's going to happen in six months. So that's why, while there are especially economic development in the West Bank, but there are also limits to that factor. This, all the questions you asked are fascinating. The second, give a lecture on any of them, but the full lecture. The second is Iranian influence. Now, Iran has a major problem in extending its influence to the Arabic, two main problems in extending its influence to the Arabic-speaking world. That is, Iran isn't Arab and it isn't Sunni. How do they try? It isn't Arab. It's predominantly, although actually only a little over half, I think the population are really can be called ethnic Persians. But, but it's not Arabic, and it's not Sunni. The question for Iranian strategy is, how do you leap those two barriers? And the way you leap the Arab barrier is by proving that you are the true defender of the Palestinians and the true enemy of Israel. And this is definitely part of Ahmadinejad's calculation. This is how you say, you know, forget about the fact that we're not Arabs. Forget about the fact that we're not Sunni. We're doing a better job of pursuing your cause than your leaders. So it's demagoguery, but it's carefully thought out demagoguery with a strategic purpose. In addition to that, you leave the Arab barrier by having Arab allies. And who are your Arab allies? Hamas, Hezbollah, Syria, and some elements in Iraq. How do you leap the Sunni-Shia barrier? You have some of your allies are Sunnis, uh, and that's, of course, the importance of Hamas. Be and because Hezbollah is Shia, and Syrians pretend to be Shia, um, but they're not. 
I mean Syrian leadership, not the Syrian people. So uh, they are have some success in leaping that barrier. But I would suggest that if Iran has nuclear weapons, they would have much more success at, at, at doing. You should see if you want to see sour, angry, hateful expressions. You should have watched the television programming from Egypt, where members of the Sunni Muslim Brotherhood held rallies to support Hezbollah without, with, it, while, while trying not in any way to be sympathetic to the Shias, and people started chanting Hezbollah and Fadlallah, and they were not happy. So a lot of the Sunni Islamists hate Iran. They hate Iran. And this is a pro one of the things the Fatah people try to do is to say, oh, those Hamas people, they're, they're, not, they're a bunch of Shia. You know, they're not, they're not right religiously. So they, Iran has real problems. Having nuclear weapons would help problems. U.S. policy. Well, I don't want to get into U.S. politics, but I'll make an observation you might find interesting. One of the many bizarre things we live in in the world today is the total reversal of uh, Western, uh, I don't want to say ideology, political views. Historically, for those of us old enough to remember it, the idea that supporting democracy and human rights um, in various countries was a liberal idea. And during the years of the Cold War, you know, always you denounce all oh, these conservatives, they will support a dictatorship just because it's anti-communist in South America, for example. They don't care what they do, they're torturing people, but they all support them because they're anti-communist. And this was a liberal issue, and I can give lots of, of details. And then George Bush pulled what can only be called, a, a, and I apologize for those who, who for this, for this will mean anything, a Disraeli maneuver. And he turned everything over. And he took the human rights and democracy issue, and they made him his. Well, that was his, and then that's bad, so then liberals have to be against it. So now the conservatives say, well, we are the supporter of human rights and democracy. And liberals, whatever, I mean, whatever lip service given, don't feel comfortable with it. So you have the specter of a liberal democratic president who, an election is stolen in Iran, peaceful demonstrations are put down, people are put on trial, and doesn't want to make a statement about it. Now, what would Harry Truman, Fra Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, John Kennedy, um, Lyndon Johnson, even perhaps Bill Clinton, probably Bill Clinton, Jimmy Carter, uh, which is a complicated issue. I mean, what would they, what would, what would McGovern and Muskie, what would all these people say about it? They would say, well, this is a very peculiar thing. So I'm just pointing this out. I'm not taking a position, but I'm just saying, be aware of this very strange kind of uh, a turnaround. Um, is it bad for the U.S. if radical Islamists take over the Middle East? You betcha, um, because uh, the, the, these are, I'll tell you a little anecdote about this in a moment. These are people who want to overthrow all existing regimes. I mean, even leave aside Israel completely. They want to overthrow Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, which they've partly done, Saudi Arabia, every country. They want to have revolutions. This involves bloodshed, involves anti-Americanism, it involves increasing terrorism, uh, opposition to all Western interests. And of course, uh, upheavals in certain areas in Europe where some sectors of immigrants would then take up this ideology and then you, you know, adapt it to their own situation. It's the biggest disaster, it's the biggest Without doing any disrespect to the economic situation or environmental issues, I would say it's the biggest disaster facing U.S. and Western countries, potentially. Um, what you, it's very hard to confront this conflict, especially at a time where no people don't want conflict. They don't want friction. They want to be liked. Um, but I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a quick anecdote. I don't know whether it's a true story because it's told by Mohammed Hussein in Haikal, who I think is a notorious liar. But it's possibly it's true. He said when Muammar Gaddafi took over Libya, uh, Haikal was sent to Libya by the then leader of Egypt, Kamal Nasser, and he said, "Meet this guy Gaddafi and tell me about them." So Haikal writes, 
I came back and I went directly into Nasser's office and he said, well, what do you think? And Haikal says, he said, it's a disaster, it's a catastrophe. And Nasser said, why is he against us? And Haikal says, no, much worse, he's for us. And he really <laughs> believes all this stuff. Um, and the, with the Arab nationals, and again, I exclude Syria, here's the, they don't quite believe what they say, but the Islamists do. And one of the reasons the nationalists have a certain element of cynicism, and remember Shakespeare's lines from Julius Caesar, um, uh, Jan Cassius says, lean and hungry, look, such men are dangerous, give me men who are sleek and fat, you know, and of course Cassius is the one who kills him. That, that the nationalists have 40 and 50 years of experience. They try to destroy Israel. They try to expel the West. They try to overthrow all the regimes. And what did they get? 1956 Suez, 1967 war, 1973 war, all the problems that came. They learned something. And even if they don't say it, they think it. And by the way, that's also true of a lot of the Fatah and PA people. But the Islamists say, I mean, I can only end with an Now, as much as the threat is to Israel, Israel is not who is most and most immediately threatened. The people who are most and most immediately threatened are Arabs, are Muslims, are people who face, and I, I didn't even say anything about Turkey, which, which is another problem with Islam. They face their countries being taken over and people being lined up against the wall and shot, and women being forced to live in an Iran or Taliban or Saudi type, Saudi Arabia. You live on a situation, and all this stuff. And, they, and the intellectuals know it. And, and that's why liberals would rather have an Arab nationalist dictatorship than an Islamist dictatorship. They're the ones facing the greatest risk, just as in Iran today, they're the people who are suffering under this regime. The irony is that in an Arabic-speaking world, Islamism is far more popular and has a brighter future than it does in Iran, where people have experience the regime, and avert, I'm not saying they can do anything about it, but a lot of people don't like it, um, and would like to change it. Um, as I said, that's not saying they can, but they'd like to. So the Middle East is a very complicated region. It is possible to understand if one takes the time and the flexibility to really like study it and try to understand it on its own terms with a reasonable amount of Cross comparisons, um, and this is what I'm trying to do. Yes. Okay, I just want to. There's some other people with questions. Oh, you want to call? Yeah. Um, so just to make a final comment to go back to my last mm -hmm. question, I don't want you to comment. I want to open up to the, to the floor. Is that the United States did sell arms to Islamists, the Taliban and the Iranian regime? No, that's not true. I'm sorry. Okay. Please, from my host. Okay. U.S. Okay. never sold arms to Taliban. That's flatly untrue. Okay. Read Michael Rubin's article in Maria Journal. Um, there was one very limited sale to Iran to get hostages out. One can disagree with that. It's not the same thing. It's not a meaningful thing. It's my opinion. Okay. The first one's a matter of fact. Okay. And then I, I wonder if, um, if there'd be a confrontation with Iran and what that would do to the oil prices in the United States. Would the administration okay. take that route or rather sell arms to let, Iran's neighbors? Let, 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 me, let me say something if, with your permission. I'll, I'll promise to be okay. in time in under 60 seconds. <laughs> it, what's going to happen is very clear. There's going to be X number of months of engagement with Iran into December, maybe into January. Presumably it will fail. There will then be a phase of increased sanctions. January, February, March, April at the latest. And then that will go on for some months, and it will have no effect. And by the time we get into 211, or more likely to say into 212, then the Iranians, if nothing else happens, will get nuclear weapons. So it's not, I don't think it's really a mystery, the basic kind of framework. I'm sorry. Hello? 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 And you spoke also about wishful thinking, which you don't know yourself. But my question is, was there a point in history when there was a possibility for a major 
change inside the PLO or in the Palestinian society, or whether um, other speakers or political leaders who might have, um, yeah, with uh, whom a change might have been possible during the 90s, for example? Right. What is everything on your it's, it's a very complicated question which I've tried to answer in my writing, the simple answer would be no. The more sophisticated answer would be, we conducted an experiment called the Peace Process from 1992 to 2000. It was an experiment on that very question. Um, and the results of the experiment were clear. And this is not a left-right thing. In Israel, at least, people across the political spectrum reached similar um, conclusions overwhelmingly, and when we know some of the things that Arafat said in private uh, during that period. Look, at the Camp David meeting, several members of the Palestinian delegation went to Israel and went to the U.S. and said, we would like to make a deal, but Arafat won't let us. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm aware of all the specifics, but Arafat dominated. And then, and then Mahmoud Abbas came in. And Mahmoud Abbas is a very complicated man. Well, he was once described to me many years ago as the closest, the closest thing in the PLO to a French intellectual, which you may take as a positive or negative remark. I mean, he, part of him knows, part of him wants to make a deal and have peace and have a state, but, but he is 100% dead set on demanding that all Palestinians who want to can go live in Israel, which is not a, which is not a, sincere nationalist position, it's a position designed to destroy Israel. So, with lots of complications, my basic answer uh, to that question is no, but with full awareness of all the detail. The, the process of transformation has either barely begun or not even begun. And as liberals in the broadest sense of the word and historic optimists we tend to believe that history is always moving in a better direction, but I mean, is Palestinian opinion more radical or less radical than it was 5, 10, or 15 years ago? Those kids being brought up in the Gaza Strip in Hamas schools with far for the mouse, you know, <laughs> telling them to go and be a suicide bomber on the children's TV, I mean, it is quite... There was, now, but more broadly, and I discussed this in, in, in my book, The Tragedy of the Middle East, there was, a, there was, during the 90s, a period of reconsideration, more generally in the Arab world. We have been hitting our head against the stone wall for 50 years. We have failed. Should we do something different? And after serious consideration, the basic answer was no. And there are a lot of elements. Let me give you one, the collapse of the Soviet bloc and of communism. In the West, this was a great thing. The Berlin Wall falls, hooray, hooray. And, well, what did it mean to the regimes? My goodness, those people, Gorbachev and those Hungarians, all those people, they loosened the reins, allowed some reform, and they ended up getting thrown out of power. We're not going to let that happen to us. They especially watched Romania. Uh, and so this made them less willing to have reform. So, if you were interested in my book, The Tragedy of the Middle East, and in my book on the liberal movement called um, the, the Arab Struggle for Democracy in the Middle East, I, in great detail, I go into all these issues. So, a question here. Yes. Okay, you know, can I get a short question, short, shorter answers? And okay. I'll do this many questions. Let me be short. Okay. Could you speak a little more to the quick po two quick points you made? One was about trying to drive a wedge between the West and Israel, particularly with what's going on now at the UN. And the second one, you talked about differences between Iranian anti-Semitism and the anti-Semitism in Arab countries. Is there anything you wanted to add to that? Okay. Yes, I could speak a bit more on that. You want to go to the next question? Sure. No, I'm only kidding. This will be short. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't say the second one. Uh, okay, on, the, on the first one, well, this is an old dream. Uh, People can perceive that it's closer to coming to reality. Look, people think that if you offer concession, it's natural, seems logical. If you offer concessions, and this is the way people behave in New Haven, perhaps. If you offer concessions, then the other side will say, oh, you're a really nice guy, you're reasonable, really you want to make a deal, okay, I'll offer concessions. And I'm sorry, it's not the way things work in the Middle East. 
offering concessions is perceived as weakness. So, if the, I mean, one of the problems is the West, much of the West refuses to deal with the Israeli experience. Sad Israel experience says, we made a deal with the PLO. We let 200,000 Palestinians come back. We let them be armed. We withdrew from all the towns uh, except, for, uh, except for Hebron, well, and, and then 80% of Hebron. We withdrew from the Gaza Strip. We withdrew from South Lebanon. We said we were ready to have a Palestinian state. And you went on the list. And what happened? On the one hand, what happened is that the um, either was rejected or the other side became more militant and demanding. In fact, now saying, oh, we're not interested in a two-state solution. We don't want everything. And the West became more critical. So the more concessions Israel gave, so now pe more people are calling the question Israel's existence and what's happening. And so you say, hmm, we make a concession and we end up worse. Maybe that's not such a good idea. And in Europe and the U.S., there has not been respect shown or taken into account that fact. The second one, uh, I, I didn't really say that. The, the, li the line is not between Iran, Iran and Arabic speakers. The line is between the Islamists and the nationalists. Okay. The radical Islamists today, and they also influence Muslims who are not Islamists, uh, are really good, pretty full-flown, uh, straight-on anti-Semitism. Whereas the nationalists have a much more complex, which varies over a wide spectrum. And you get people in Egypt writing it's a disgrace what people say that the Holocaust didn't happen, it's humiliation, and we make fools of ourselves before the world. So that's that's where the you know the line is drawn. Not it's not a question of the wrong. But, but you see look look at what's just happened. And I, I'm gonna say something and I honestly think this is a fair representation. A radical terrorist Islamist group whose official position is genocide of the Jews seized power in Gaza by force. Parentheses, yes, I know it was an election, but they broke the election agreement and seized power by force. Seized power in Gaza. No international reaction. Then they started firing mortars rocket, and rockets and staging cross-border raids against Israel. No reaction. Then there was a ceasefire, and they announced they broke the ceasefire and started firing rockets and missiles, and no international reaction. Israel goes in. Hamas uses civilians as human shields, mosques uh, as firing positions. They put their military headquarters in the hospital. And what happens? Israel is in the tribunal in the UN facing sanctions. Now, do you think that if you were Hamas or someone watching it, you would say, boy, those Hamas people made a really bad mistake. We weren't going to try that strategy. Or would you say, hey, that strategy really works well. It succeeds. The damage, the material damage and deaths are not important to the revolutionary Islamists. So the West is teaching radicals and anti-Semites that what you do and, and what you're doing is paying, paying off. And while, of course, there have been anti-Iran and anti-Ahmadinejad stuff, the West doesn't want to increase sanctions against them. Ahmadinejad comes to the UN. He's like, so what you're saying, what, what the, the objective for, uh, of the, the atmosphere is saying is, this stuff works really well. And when you see something working really well, you do more of it, not less of it. That's the message that's being conveyed. So I'm going to collect two questions here. and. Um... Can we separate um, Palestinian and PLO anti-Semitism to other antagonisms that other indigenous people have developed against other invading people? Uh, uh, my basically answer is no, and I'll tell you why. Because if you just mean we don't like you or we hate you, but the idea of a complex, sophisticated, all-embracing ideology which governs your behavior, I mean, is not, does not happen. And now we can go in 5, 10, 15, 20 examples. I'll, I'll tell you something that doesn't completely apply to what you said, but I think it's a parallel to it. I have a number of Arab friends, they've gone to Japan, they've gone to China. And they go to Japan and they say, oh, you know, the Americans dropped two nuclear weapons on you. Well, how do you feel about that? Or they go to China and they say, oh, you suffered decades of imperialism. How do you feel about that? And as they convey to me, the, the answer they get is, we got over it, we moved on, you know, that's history. So, you know, the question is, do you move beyond into some constructivist approach 
Like, you know, yeah, we were angry you did this, but now we have to deal with the present. And Jews face this also, because I have to deal with Germans and I have to deal with Poles, and we discuss these issues and we try to understand each other and, and get beyond it. But if you, you know, we can go through the Talmud issue, we can go through Australia, we, and no, you don't see anything like this. Because, and, and you also don't see in general an, decades of, of anti-civilian terrorism. You don't see the, 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 the IRA uh, wanting to wipe uh, Britain off the map. And in fact, the IRA violence goes up and down. But this is not, so no, it is, it is qualitatively different. And, and one, I mean, there are a number of elements that make it different. Having, you know, 20 countries or more behind you, which can serve as a base and support, having a historical structure of anti-Semitism, uh, but no. I mean, Yasser Arafat did not turn out to be um, Nelson Mandela. <laughs> so, and, and on this note, so Alon will ask the next question, but before we get to Alon, just as a note, we're going to show a film on the indigenous Jewish people of the Middle East. They're the largest group of, the Mizrahi Jews are the largest Jewish group in Israel. And we're showing a film on the forgotten refugees, uh, Jewish refugees, that will be shown later in the year. Well, I uh, want you to maybe try to uh, uh, talk about uh, Turkey. Uh, Turkey is uh, maybe one country that deteriorated from a point of uh, being very uh, westernized mm -hmm. or uh, holding democratic uh, values to becoming an Islamic uh, shadow of maybe now what uh, Iran is, uh, maybe they are going there. And my uh, question is, uh, in your view, is there anything that can be done to reverse the process? Um, I don't see the Europeans uh, taking uh, you know, the Turks now into the European Union. Is there any other way to well, well, first of all, if you'd like to invite me back to the lecture in Turkey, I'd be happy to. So let me see some of my... Uh, I'm editor of Turkish studies, written a number of books on Turkey. I was the first Israeli uh, uh, exchange professor in Turkey. It's a country very dear to me. Um, I have many Turkish friends. I had lunch with one of my Turkish friends the day before yesterday. He said, always remember, and this is true in Iran and other places, you know, don't confuse the government with the people, as he put it, the, uh, the captain with the, the ship. Um, it, 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 it's a really interesting. The AKP, which is the ruling party in Turkey, broke off from the old style Islamists who were very close to like Muslim Brotherhood. You know, Marx said in Communist Manifesto, the communists disdain to conceal their aims. The old style Islamists did. The new style Islamists, and you, you, in the Arabic speaking world, it's very hard to find an example of this. There's a little, there was an effort in Egypt, but it failed. Um, they said, the look, we are modern, we, we want to be uh, Europe, part of Europe, um, we, uh, we, are, we, are, we are a center-right party of family, excuse me, family values, we are not Islamists at all. And there was a huge debate in Turkey, do they mean it or not, are they wolf in sheep's clothing or not? And over the last, and I mean, I am somewhat agnostic and open, um, over the last year, we've seen that the AKP has increasingly come out as, a, as an Islamist party. I could tell you personal experiences. Um, uh, I, I don't have the time, but I'd love to tell you some anecdotes. I think as long as the AKP is in power and is going to continue to be in power, they're going to go down that road. The only way, there are only two ways to get them out of power. One is if they lose an election. If they lose an election, it has to be because the opposition parties get their act together and the most incompetent politicians I've ever seen. But that's a possibility. The other possibility is a military takeover. That's become less likely than in the past. They might push the military too far. Up until recently, the AKP played it really smart, and they're starting to be overcome by arrogance and push harder and harder. But I mean, you know, the kind of thing like the main opposition media group is the Doyan group, the Dogan group, and uh, they took the, the government took them to court and found them guilty of various trumped up charges and they issued a fine of $3.9 billion. Now I did not say $3.9 million. 
I said $3.9 billion. So in other words, what they're saying is, you either stop all your criticism of us, or we'll wipe you out. They're taking over the media, people are intimidated, they're putting their people uh, into government, the situation for Jews in Turkey is becoming worse, something I can talk about in greater detail. Um, so, is it reversible? Yes, but not by the continued presence of this government. One would think that the existence of a government in Turkey which felt more comfortable with Iran than with the United States would be a matter of concern for the U.S. government, except for some junior people in the bureaucracy, it's not even on the radar screens. And as the, Tur the Turkish oppositionists say, the U.S. and Europe, well, U.S. still thinks of AKP government as a great example of moderate um, Muslim democracy, but if in fact you're wiping out freedom of the press and freedom of speech and, and anti-Semitism and you're preaching anti-Semitism increasingly, no, that's not what you are. It's a very, very serious situation and, and it's very clear that this, for all practical purposes the special relationship between Turkey and Israel you know, is over. Um, and I can tell you a lot more. And if, by the way, if you are interested, you want to get my blog, where I write, you know, these are things I write about. I've just written a full-length piece on Israel-Turkey relationship as a subject for a Turkish, for a journal on Turkey, but I'm going to print it. So if, if you want to get the details, you can look at my books, you can, you know, subscribe to some of the publications. But it's a very serious setback for Western interests. And it's not noticed. Now, of course, in Europe, European point of view, people may not be altogether unhappy to have a good reason to keep Turkey out of the EU forever. In fact, I, I made up two, two jokes to my Turkish friends, which they liked a lot. One is instead of saying, you know, in Jewish tradition, you say, may you live to be 120, you say, may you live to see Turkey enter the EU. <laughs> and the other one is when, when Turks ask me, when will the Arab Israeli Israeli Palestinian conflict be resolved? I'll say, you know, it's going to be an amazing day. It's on the same day Turkey. Uh, enters the EU, and then they start <laughs> laughing because they understand precisely what I'm saying. Uh, Professor Rubin, thanks. I want to have a question that takes off on your cogent observation that you don't wish to uh, lie for peace, as it were. You like to face the hard reality on the ground and go unpleasant it is. Um, that, along with your very cogent descriptions of why the much desired peace is virtually an impossibility for now and for a long time down the road, unfortunately. You sit here in America, you watch the evening news, you watch our presidential campaign debates, and you read the New York Times, et cetera, and you think, it seems to be it's almost early 1993, and it's the Eve of Oslo, and the tape keeps playing over and over. A few handshakes, a few signatures in the documents, and we've got ourselves a piece, or we know in second, et cetera. Have you ever given thought to, and what is your thoughts on why the reality that I think you so cogently describe in your writings and your lectures? doesn't permeate, at least in our... Every day. Every day. Uh, first of all, you should stop reading the New York Times. If you want to read a newspaper, you should read the Washington Post, uh, which I think is a much better paper, um, especially now. Yes, and in fact, I had a discussion with someone in, in Washington who's very knowledgeable, and he told me there's a mutual acquaintance of ours he just met with, and he was saying, well, and I said, look, you know, what do you, I mean, what do you think? I mean, how... How can he say this? And he, and he said, yeah, wishful thinking. But to, to be a little more complicated, there are several facts. There, there are two particular arguments that I would use. The first stems from, three arguments. First stems from the, everybody's alike. I mean, what is the central problem of getting people to understand Israel's dilemma? And it's very simple, which is, it's counterintuitive. In other words, it, of course, Palestinians, all they want, and to quote, end to the quote, occupation, state of their own, peace, children go to school, grow up. Yeah, it's logical. So if you say to people, um, sorry, let me just make, write down the other two so I don't forget them. Um, okay. Um, what you say is not logical from their experience, which is no. Whatever people think privately, the public discourse and the political is, we are ready to fight on for decades, to total victory, that anyone who wants to give up anything is a traitor, that it doesn't matter how much we suffer um, as long as we, you know, win in the end, etc., 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 etc. 
it's hard because it does not correspond with people's experience. And once you have a dominant ideology in academia, the word Sadian, which is, it is forbidden to say that not everybody thinks exactly the same, then you're paralyzed and you can't deal with it. So that's the first problem. And even people who consider themselves Middle East experts in the academic Middle East and don't understand this. The second problem is what I call reasoning backwards. This is incredible. It's powerful and people don't even realize it exists. We want peace. How do you get peace? Well, what do you do to get peace? You do, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have, and therefore, any argument that forecloses that can't be true because you're thinking of, I mean, this is Barack Obama and other people say, okay, we'll get the parties, we all know the perfect solution, we get the parties together, you have an independent Palestinian state, you have its capital in East Jerusalem, you may or may not have border modifications, you have uh, uh, security guarantees for Israel, you give them $25 billion, you know, we all know the list. So it's doable, it's easy, but it's, it's not examining the actual situation, it's starting at the goal you want, and then reasoning backward, assuming that there is a way to achieve the goal. Not asking what goal is realizable, but you, I think I made my point. And the third one is fear of facing the contraries. Because if you understand what I say, it requires you to do and think certain things. And you don't want to. The Western countries don't want to confront radical Islamism. They don't want to confront Iran. We understand why. They operate off of Vietnam. They operate off of Iraq. I mean, they may soon be operating off of Afghanistan, which, parenthetically, I would say is definitely not a war the U.S. should fight. Um, I mean, so you don't, now, Paul Berman had a very interesting point. He said, how do people respond to September 11th? And he said, there are two tempting alternatives. One is to say no problem really exists. It's just a matter of misperception. And the second, and this is, by the way, a very Jewish answer is, we're the problem. We did something wrong. But if we do something right, then the problem will go away, it will be solved. Because you don't want to deal with the problem. No, the problem is with the other side of what they think and what they do, and you cannot, I'm sorry, yes, I know you'd like to, you cannot change that. And if the evasion of Iraq was misconceived, the part of it on the analysis, which is the problem is dictatorship and, and so on, it, it, it was right, but the idea that we can fix it was wrong. So, you know, the irony is it's easy to overestimate external factors. You can overestimate them in terms of blame. It's all our fault. If it weren't for us, then... And you can overestimate it in terms of solution. We can fix everything. No, we can't. The West's, West's role in fixing the problems of the Muslim majority or Arabic-speaking world is, you know, 5, 10, 15%. Of the equation. Let me uh, conclude. Am I concluding? There's one. We have time for one more question. Okay, please. And then I'll conclude. Okay. So yes. we have like a few minutes left. So. To what extent do you blame uh, liberal intellectuals, both in Israel and the West, for now very aggressively promoting the idea of a one-state solution, so that it's now openly discussed in the New York Times? Um, in terms of keeping the fantasy alive. Well, speaking, speaking as a liberal democrat and a historically supportive of the Labour Party, um, 